Hello again, folks. Today we're going to be starting our last chapter for this semester. This will be chapter 12, Statistics. Um, today, if you look at the calendar, let's see. This is uh, November 16th, over here. Uh, just a week before Thanksgiving, almost. I, I know that I wrote uh, 12 1 and 12 2, but uh, in looking at it, it, it seems appropriate to just do 12 2 on Wednesday, so I'll, I'm just going to do 12 1 today. <clears throat> okay, and we'll be perfectly in sync, so everything will be copacetic. Um, let me give you this to take into consideration. Here's the packet of information on one of those open diagrams for uh, maybe some terminology. There's a word problem uh, to understand population and versus sample. And then there's some uh, word problems that I stole from the textbook. I put the solutions here because it is kind of a, it's a whole new world. So uh, I figured it would be good to have the answers there. Right, just in case you're not watching this and it, you will still have access to that. All right, if you print it. <clears throat> Now, let's see. Um, here's how it will go. For chapter 12, in summary, um, 12 1, which is what we're doing today, is about um, data, basically gathering and organizing uh, data. I'll get into the specifics of that in a minute, but just to give you an overview of where we're headed, 2-2, uh, two, two, pardon me, 12-2, going backwards. 12-2 uh, is about picturing data. Um, 12.3 it might be best described as, uh, uh, described as types of averages. That may sound silly if you're not, if you're unaware, but there are several averages. Mean, median, mode. Um, C, let's see. 12.4 is types of variances. Variation. Uh, Twelve five is about the normal distribution. And 12.6 is about modeling, writing equations, basically. They're not exactly labeled that way. If you have the textbook, you may go, well, then our 12 board is not called such and such, but these are what they are about, nonetheless. Okay. So as I said, we're going to do 12.1 today, and that's it. On Wednesday, we'll be doing 12.2. Okay, this is nice and cooperative this morning, very good. Let me get a sip of water. question as well, what is statistics? If you want, um, you can look out this uh, sheet just for reference. 
to build some vocabulary here. I'm a little concerned it might be kind of far away, um, but I'll do my best. Um, statistics is the practice. Ooh, that's faint. Uh, that might be a dud. Organizing and presenting data for the purpose of drawing. general conclusions about something under consideration. I'm purposely writing this uh, larger than I would normally because I just want it to be visible. Statistics is the practice of collecting, organizing, and presenting data for the purpose of drawing general conclusions about something under consideration. Okay. Now, if you don't feel warm and fuzzy about that, it gets better. Stick with me. Okay. Right. Move this aside for a moment. Um, there are basically two parts to this. Uh, I kind of alluded to the first part already. There is what is referred to as descriptive statistics. And then there's inferential. Statistics is basically the data, data, whichever you prefer, portion of this. All right. That is the, the collecting, All right. All right. the organizing. Presenting, which is really this presenting. It's diagrams. There is if 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 you like drawing, right, and you like making tables and charts or even something, you know, that organizes information, an infographic if you will, you probably will like statistics. Its job, if nothing else, is to take something nebulous, mysterious, and confusing and make it palatable to anyone. Right. <clears throat> As is the case of all math, but especially statistics. Its job is to make things clear. Right. Um, the purpose here, the inferential statistics, this is really the purpose, if you will, that I mentioned. 
and it's about something called hypothesis testing. which that phrase hypothesis should come uh, be somewhat familiar to you. All right. um, I'm going to bring back uh, uh, sort of a diagram that I had given, I think, in MAT 113. Right. I've evolved it since then, but uh, hypothesis testing is, uh, well, hypothesis is a piece of vocabulary from scientific method, which should give you an idea of what kind of frame of mind you have to be in when you are performing statistics or engaged in it. Hypothesis testing is basically determining if there is a relationship between two variables. Kind of a very general way of thinking about it. Hypothesis testing, in a more, uh, in a broader sense, is um, a temporary answer to a question, right? And you are trying to figure out if that is a, a good answer as you're testing it. Right. Uh, there's uh, some phraseology or terms that we get thrown around here. Correlation. and regression. You may have heard that phrase, correlation is not causality. Correlation is when two things occur simultaneously. One is not the cause of the other, but they happen to come together. Regression is basically um, the equation that illustrates that there is, in fact, a relationship between two variables. This is, again, for the purpose of making general conclusions. about whatever is being studied from what though from data it might seem a little silly that I keep erasing these things and then drawing something else and then doing the exact same thing over and over again but that's the situation, I have no board space. I'm just trying to organize this information as concisely as I can. Remember this. This is uh, something that would have been brought up in uh, Math 113. All right. Thought processes. did this the justice it deserves back at the time, so let me make up for that, make up for that sin now. <laughs> okay. There is um, inductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, think Sherlock Holmes. Right. Sherlock Holmes not being a real person, of course, is a fictitious character, but think Sherlock Holmes. The behavior and um, methodology of Sherlock, all right, involves the scientific method. Right. We'll see how in a moment. When you think deductive reasoning, 
think Aristotle was in fact a real person. Uh, the student of Plato, who was famous, the, famously the student of Socrates. And Socratic method is basically handed down to us from Aristotle. <clears throat> when you think deductive reasoning, just to get a feel for it, if inductive reasoning is the scientific method, and I'm hoping that that's not too faint, that's a little bit better maybe, um, think of this as being more uh, geometric, more like geometry, all right? Proofs, all right? Logic. It's more thought than it is experiment. One could have a thought experiment, of course, but it's, the scientific method is really, you know, real life. And right? this is in your mind, right? It's not only true. Right? Right? But just to distinguish these two things, right? one can coexist, you know, with the other, of course. Distinguish them, the nitty gritty, if you will. All right. Think of these two things as having a start and a goal. All right. That they're headed toward. The starting point for engaging in inductive reasoning right, is that you have some specific example, some situation, right, an observation in the more classic scientific method sense. Right. And through a process of hypothesis testing, all right. uh, you try to form a general conclusion or a rule you know, or a theory, the operative term there is general conclusion. Hypothesis testing is the in between here. Anyhow, yeah. something is specific, you get with something you will land on something general here. All right. When you're engaged in deductive reasoning, it's really just the opposite. All right. You start with a general statement. You know, a rule of some sort, right? A law, a theory, and you do this. Um, you work your way backwards to form, you know, a specific conclusion. Again, the best example I could give you is that this is something of geometric proofs. When you're asked in geometry, think of maybe, you know, ninth or 10th grade math class, right? Oh, here's a shape, you know, prove that it is a triangle, you know? Well, if you know that a triangle, the interior angles add up to 180 degrees, you might try, that is a rule, you know, that is established. You might try to apply it to the specific, you know, uh, illustration that you have, right? <clears throat> Anyhow, um, why am I mentioning this? Well, inductive reasoning, 
This is where statistics lives. <laughs> On this side of the board, you're going to say, okay? Statistics is a process of inductive reasoning. Right? It's math, but it's not geometry style math, if you will. At least not immediately. Okay. Okay. Um, I hope that elucidates. Let's talk about the actual data itself. I bet you have some inkling already what data is, and it isn't wrong uh, to say, oh, it's numbers. I mean, that is true, but there's more to it than that. I think a, st a statistician might get a little mad if you just simply said, ah, it's just numbers, all right? In, in that tone of voice, still would be worse. Um, where does data come from? Well, data comes from uh, measurements. And observations as well that don't involve a measurement. Um, what would be referred to as the quantitative data. to say this was again I don't want anyone to get mad at me but the numbers portion of this in so far as so I'm going to put the word but here you know to add to it quantitative um, data which is measurements all right and measurements involve numbers right? so the numbers but they're measurements all right they're an instrument was involved somehow it's not just willy-nilly <clears throat> Counting is not the same as measuring either, you know. Um, there's no sin in counting, especially when you're talking about people, but um, just make a distinction. A measurement is something that involves a tool somehow, you know, whereas counting is like, you know, you just, you physically counted something. All right? This has a unit, you know, measurements have units. You know, counting does not really have a unit. Uh, at least not in the, sen in the same sense. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I'll give you an example. But um, let me uh, complete this thought. When you see this phrase, quantitative statistics, know that it's referring to the numbers insofar as measurements are concerned. All right. Um, and then there's observations, right, which you might call qualitative. Statistics. All right. This is more descriptive. Of physical characteristics. So, um, here's an example to illustrate this, all right. One could gather data, all right, about the, the height, the heights, the collective heights of an entire population. That'd be a challenge, but it is possible. In order to 
measure a height, okay, um, um, you would need to involve a tool, certainly. You know, I should uh, maybe correct myself. I mean, I suppose counting could be part of this as well. Right, just there is a difference between counting and measuring. All right. Measuring is, you know, something that requires a tool. Counting doesn't necessarily require a tool. Yeah. Um, as for physical characteristics, uh, the most basic thing I can think of is something like the color, of, you know, of lobsters. I guess it's no coincidence I chose red, right? There are, however, as rare as it may be, blue lobsters, right? It's a rarity, and perhaps one could gather statistics about that rarity, but uh, the color is a qualitative aspect of a lobster. Red or blue or whatever have you. The sort of greenish red, rusty color in nature, and the poor things end up being red from cooking them. Um, for right now, again, associate the phrase quantitative with measurements, all right, at least measurements, all right, the numbers portion of this, and qualitative with a description of something. timeline a while ago and it isn't super important but I like to sort of develop it as we go along because I think it helps to understand the subject whatever we're talking about you don't have to write this per se and it might be you know slightly imprecise but it's just to give you an idea all right of where things are in the history of math so to speak all right so I'm going to draw a timeline in the more historical sense. Right, here's a timeline. Um, I had uh, to this point in the conversation, one, two, three, four, five, six, two, three, four, six, um, established this. Again, this is, I'm not a historian, but I have a brain and I could reason this through. And this is just to get you a feel. There's prehistory. Right. Uh, there's the ancient. I'm just using these phrases because it gives you an idea. Uh, there's the medieval. Well, what is medieval? What is referred to as modern modernity, and then let's just say late modernity. Okay. What's prehistory? Probably what is uh, before the point of uh, 5000 BC E. Whereas the ancient is something like from that point of 5,000 to arguably 500 CE, otherwise known as AD, but uh, just to be fair, all right? AD, which is the, the, the sort of the Catholic way of talking about it, I myself was raised Catholic, um, is Anno Domini, which is a uh, yeah, belief in Jesus, of course, but uh, uh, to be uh, more general, right, it's the same time frame, we use the Common Era, right? So BC, instead of before Christ, it would be before the Common Era, right? It's the same time frame, right? <coughs> All right, uh, let's just say the medieval is approximately, and this is again stretching it a bit, 500, where we left off here, to about 1500. 1492 is Columbus, right? That lovely man. Um, and he was at the end of the Renaissance period, right? Um, so you might say even the late Middle Ages, right? Very, very, very late. 
right? Modernity, and I'm kind of skipping a little bit in time here, is I think people would say something like maybe 17 or 1600. To the present. This is not precise again. And late modernity would be something like 1800. Some people say like up to about World War II, uh, but it depends on who you talk to. So say 1900, right? Roughly. Right. This is a little bit earlier. This is a little bit later. Right. Just for lack of a phrase. Right. Why am I doing this? Well, we have discussed basically this idea of uh, counting. Right? Where would that basically begin in time? I'm trying to get an idea. All right, it might be prehistoric. Right, before written symbols were established for counting, the concept might have existed. Why? Because you know, intuitively, we have ten fingers and ten toes. Right. Right, and uh, we they've used to count. Right, some ancestor of ours, you know, Grog the cave dweller. Right, might have went, oh, me no four. You know, whatever. <laughs> respectful but uh, of our ancestry all right but uh, it certainly would have spoken English that's, that's cuckoo but uh, anyhow counting might predate actual recorded time recorded history as in written all right the concept of counting all right um, what you might refer to as a you know a number sense even animals appear to have a number sense if you left out different amounts of food for an animal uh, in a controlled environment, say some kind of experiment, they might intuitively go to uh, the larger amount because although they may not go, oh yeah, one acorn, two acorns, three acorns, whatever, and this is only five, you know, uh, or vice versa, you know, they know more, all right, or less. They have a number sense, all right? We organisms, earthlings, we have number sense, all right? Then there's arithmetic which I'm just abbreviating here, all right? Which is what? Well, it's operations, all right? Like adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing, and more than that, but uh, adding and subtracting at least, all right? That begins at some point in the ancient, all right? Geometry as well, all right? Arguably after, all right? No one knows for sure. Right, but it would make sense that you have the numbers system and the concept of adding down before maybe you will start applying, you know, geometry. All right, what is geometry? Well, um, it's shapes, obviously. Right. Egyptian type of geometry was for practical application, building projects. All right, and then the Greeks took it a little bit further and applied it to logic. In the Middle Ages, algebra is the cutting edge of mathematics. Right? What is algebra? Algebra is techniques, basically. Balancing. Solving for an unknown. Right? It's a more cerebral kind of math. Right? Calculus, you might say, is um, um, advanced techniques. With algebra, if you get if you get to take that class, and I would certainly encourage that, you could calculate something like volume, which you would do in geometry ordinarily, all right. But if it, irregular shapes, you know, it's not impossible to apply geometry to figure out the you know the uh, the volume of the irregular uh, shapes. But it, calculus is what makes it easier. Right? All right. And then there's statistics. All right? which is practical applications right, and applied to sciences. You know, it's useful math, right? 
right? I th that's why I would encourage a person to study statistics, all right? Calculus as well, all right? You could learn anything, all right? But um, if, you, if you don't feel really super warm and fuzzy about math, consider statistics because it, it is a very human kind of math, all right? Because it has applications, all right? Um, let's see. All right, let me, I have more to my little diagram here, but I think I'm wasting too much time. All right, this is where we are basically right now. We're at the end of the road, right? The idea, some, some basic idea of statistics, I'm sure could be found elsewhere. All right, um, if you go back to the ancient, you know, just say hmm, here, you know. Uh, even the Babylonians, and Egyptians employed a census. All right, which is just counting, really. Right? Counting number of animals, counting number of humans, what have you, counting grain, I suppose. It's practical, it's just not as sophisticated as the, the, you know, the sort of math that we have now, you know, or well, at least since 1800, roughly. some terminology now. Uh, I definitely need the space. So I'm going to erase this. Some of the terms that you will need to know. verify that this is in the frame here. Looks like it's okay. As previously stated, statistics is the practice of collecting, organizing, and presenting data you know, for the purpose of drawing a general conclusion. Population, which is a phrase you might recognize a term from uh, probability, and certainly probability and statistics are very strongly related. They have sort of different uses. Uh, usages, and that's not correct English, sorry. Uses and usages. Right. I need more coffee, I think. Probability and statistics are closely related, but they have different uses. Um, anyhow, they share some of the same terminology. It's just the context to tweak ever so slightly. Um, the phrase, the word population in the context of statistics. Right. 
is all contents of the set items or people of interest people especially because statistics is applied to you know information about humans of interest all contents items or people of interest in the context of probability and discrete math you might have say well a population is like the universal set you know it's the all of the contents or items of the set They use the phrase, uh, you know, set and population somewhat synonymously. Right. Um, as for a sample, this is typically and I'm going to underline that typically a subset of the population and I'll just check that this is visible looks like it's okay this is a bit faint in uh, discrete math a subset can be technically all things included or nothing at all or some you know chunk of it um, in the context of Statistics, uh, the um, definition is tweaked a little bit. It's typically a subset of the population that is a portion, not the whole. Right? In discrete math, a subset can also technically be the whole thing. unbiased subset. I need a space for this and I'll write it in red to make it a little bit easier to read. Ideally, this is an ideal. Right. Um, a small replica of the population. Um, that is truly representative. Of it. I don't know if that's not too faint, so I will read this and hopefully correct this if I need to make it a little bit larger. That's a T, and that's a T, and it's an A. Right. Uh, the ideal sample all right, is an unbiased sample. All right. A small replica of the population that is truly representative of it. You can have a sample that is unfortunately leaving out of fundamental characteristics, right? and then it's not unbiased. Okay. Um, as sort of a visual aid here. Erase this again. Uh, 
um, if you could think of a population as again being the whole, the universal set, all of the stuff, and I'll just sort of encapsulate like a big egg here. Right. No, 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 no. Um, I think I did that hand gesture for him. Um, a sample would be some chunk of it. Right. This could be a sample. Right. This could be the sample, some portion of it. This could be the sample. And here's the thing. If you want a good unbiased sample, and as an ethical statistician, you want a good unbiased sample, you probably shouldn't confine your sample where you're taking information or data or people from. That is just one portion of the population, right? You probably want a little bit from each, you know, a thorough mixture, right? sample data might be a little from each area, right? Not limited. You know, unless there's some conditions that need to be met. studying cows, you wouldn't need necessarily chickens as part of your, you know, your data. Um, this book labels five sampling methods. This is how you get data. Techniques or methods. random sampling. Sampling. Stratified. Uh, 
And then, although I don't really care for this, but uh, it's mentioned in your book, so I will include it. Um, convenience. Random sampling. Right? Systematic sampling. Cluster sampling. Stratified sampling. And convenience sampling. Just to give you a vague idea temporarily, all right? Um, and we're going to do things in basically this order, all right? Um, random, systematic, cluster, stratified, and convenience. Um, random sampling is something like, right? right there's more specifics to this. All right, the lottery. Right. So associate the concept of a lottery with random sampling for right now. All right, this is not the best example, but it's what I can pick up off the top of my head. Um, systematic sampling is something like decimation. Right. Now, not to uh, get into it, but uh, Romans, barbarians that they were, right? They didn't think so, but um, they used to, when they used to punish their own soldiers, used to engage in a process called uh, decimation, which is basically nine people ganging up on a tenth person <laughs> and killing them. <laughs> if you just avoid and just leave the, the nine people out of it and just say that you're considering every tenth person, for example, you know, as being eliminated somehow, that's what decimation is, you know, and it's more at its core, you know, it's killing every 10th person. Okay. All right. Um, a terrible example that is, but it's systematic, right? There's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, logic to it, even if it's awful. Um, when you think of cluster sampling, the first thing is think of groups, you know, rather than individuals. I mean, to make it down to individuals eventually, but, and uh, even more importantly, uh, associate this with the word area. Right? If you hear about an area, that's usually a good indication that you're dealing with cluster sampling. Uh, stratified is kind of grouping as well. This is grouping, but I would say uh, more specific or more deliberate. Cluster grouping is more akin to random, you know? It's like a person wasn't planning on doing something from a specific group, taking data from a specific group. It's just taking a group all at once. Stratified is more deliberately choosing from a specific group. So this is groups that are deliberate, right? intentional. All right, um, convenience sampling is Sadly, uh, using what you have, limited data, which is really not a good thing, you know, working with what you have. It isn't nefarious, you know, it's not for some evil reason, right, but you perhaps don't have access to a large amount of people for your, you know, survey or what have you. Uh, let me give you an example, and again, I think I sort of, uh, I may have mentioned this in Mac 113, if you had me. I want to improve what I have done. 
So if you have this sheet, we'll talk about this. This is just to illustrate what is the difference between population and sample again, all right? And then we could decide which one of these types of uh, sampling techniques, methods, uh, is akin to this problem, okay? Um, I have to read it. I purposely put these two things in uh, color and the numbers as well. Right. Yellowstone Park in Wyoming has the largest population of free-roaming bison in the world, water buffalo. To approximate the total, a sample of 200 bison are captured, tagged, and released, which I want to say, as cool as this sounds, uh, they put a, a tag in and import animals a year, all right? Just to keep track, all right? Later, a total of 120 bison is observed by park rangers, six of which have tags. All right. All right. Write a proportion equation to approximate the total population of free-roaming bison. This is a slight improvement over the way I had it, I believe, in MAT 113. All right. uh, I think the more appropriate use of the word phrase sample is when I'm referring to this number, not to belabor the point. Anyhow, let us look at this. Right. You have um, uh, an idea probably of writing a proportion equation, and if not, I'll remind you. Uh, first of all, for this example, right, we're trying to find the total population. I really shouldn't even have to say the word total, it's implied. But we want to know what the population is. Right? And in order to do that, we're going to employ a proportion equation. All right, which remember is a ratio set equal to a second ratio. What is a ratio? It's a glorified fraction, really. Um, the truth is that a fraction is a more specific form of ratio. The conditions are more specific, right? But we use the words interchangeably, all right? What is a fraction? A fraction is a top, that line, and then the bottom, if you will. So if you have one ratio and then you have a second ratio, and it's an equation because there's this equal sign here, right? Anyhow, that means that we have four voids that we would have to fill in. Right. Now, what is being assumed in this case, and it's true, what's reasonable, that the a sample is proportionate uh, to a population right. again to, to uh, clarify remember a sample is a portion of something right? and a population is a total Right, or the whole. And if something is proportionate, it means not the same size. Right? The relationship, the ratios are equal. Right? The relationship to the top figure, to the bottom figure, may be different looking than the the relationship from the top figure here and the bottom figure here. But if you consider them as a whole or ratio, these would be equal to each other. The individual parts are not certainly equal, but they may be corresponding. Correspond, right? These correspond, they're not equal. They're related, if you will. All right, now, the trick to writing a proportion equation is to be consistent. There may be more than one way to do it, likely there is, but be consistent, right? right. In how you arrange. 
the parts. All right, I mean the part here and the part here and the part here and the part here. Whatever you decide the top is, all right, be consistent through the problem. Whatever you decide the bottom is, that type of thing, be consistent through the problem. Now in this case, what occurred to me is that we'll form a ratio, a glorified fraction, an obvious top, that line in the bottom, this way. The sample will be the top in all, case, in all cases. And the population will be the bottom in all cases. Right? The total, more or less. You want to use that as a stand-in. Right. So these are the, the terms that would get used in a statistics class. Sample, population, the portion, the whole, and their relationship to one another is written in the style of a fraction. What we would do for practical reasons to figure out, you know, to approximate a number of water buffalo without having to go up to every one of them and count them, which would be probably impossible, um, we're going to do this. We're going to say, all right, let's just change the words a little bit. Let's call the top thing uh, something a little less specific, the portion, all right? And we'll call the bottom thing the total. And we'll be like that consistently throughout. All right. What is this? Sorry. job I applied to. Bad timing. Right. Um, okay, so we have these voids again that we're going to fill in, these four. Setting that up is the hard part, which is why I'm taking my time here. All right. Let's start with a fragment of something, a portion. All right. Start with this sentence. To approximate the total, a sample of 200 bison are, uh, what is that word? Captured, tagged, and released, all right? So to start with, the number 200 is a portion of something. It is, in the, the parlance of statistics, it's a sample. So right here, I'm gonna put the word, put the number 200. Okay. What are we looking for? We're looking for the population. So 200 out of this mysterious total that is the population. So you could just leave this as a question mark if you like, right? Since this is really the population, that's the total, same difference. Or more likely in an algebraic equation, equation then use a letter, so N or B or X or whatever you like. Uh, maybe B would be intuitive, so I'll use the letter B for bison. Okay. Now again, be consistent. When you're filling in the second one, you want the fragment on top, and you want some kind of a total as the, the denominator here. All right. Read this second sentence. Later, uh, a total of 120, and that's kind of a key phrase there, uh, a signal. Bison is observed by park rangers, six of which have tags. All right? Six is now the fragment, right? the portion, the chunk of the whole. So I would, again, to be consistent, take that top thing and make that the portion, six. All right? The number that is quoted as the, the now total that we have is 120. Okay, and now you have a proportion equation that is complete. You have the majority of the four numbers. You have the three out of four. So you can figure out what the fourth thing is, namely for this purpose, all right, uh, via cross multiplication. So you multiply diagonally like this, and you write 6b to summarize. And you multiply diagonally like this, and you could actually do the, arith the arithmetic because it's just numbers, right? 200 
and 120. 2 times 12 is 24. And then if you have one, two, three zeros, then you have 24,000. Right. How do you solve an algebraic equation if it has a 6 attached to it? You divide by 6. And then 24 divided by 6 is 4. And then there are, again, three zeros attached. So it should be 4,000 bison. Isn't that clever if you think about it? <coughs> um, I'm not sure why they decided 200 was the original amount that they tagged, all right? All right, but having done just that little bit of work, all right, they spared themselves, you know, 3,800 bison, all right? So the, the benefit of this, uh, I hope, is obvious. It's that a person, if you're trying to calculate a population, yes, in theory, you could go about the process of counting, going up to each individual, whatever they are, a person or, you know, some uh, animal person, you know, and, uh, you know, physically counting them. But it gets more and more arduous, you know, uh, the more people or whatever is involved. So you don't have to. You could get a very good approximate by basically creating a proportion equation, all right? You have some idea, all right? Uh, six out of 120 is a chunk out of some total. It should be proportionate, all right? The sample is proportionate to the population, all right? The portion is proportionate to the total somehow. Um, as for comparing, you know, uh, this problem to the sampling methods that we have mentioned, we, the word we, um, this would be, I think, most akin to random. Uh, uh, what I'm going to try to do is limit myself to four spaces here. Probably overkill, but let me just do this anyway. I want to try to get this organized as best I can. suspicious. My three-handed skills are not so great. You're running a straight line, I've noticed. A part of the problem is, unfortunately, being on top of whatever you're writing. I say this to my classes every semester. What is the difference between writing on a board and writing on a piece of paper? Right? When you're writing on a piece of paper, you're a certain distance from it. You know? When you're writing on a board, it's like you're doing this, basically. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little too close. So drawing things are, uh, you know, out of whack. You, know, so you have to compensate for that, and I haven't learned that skill yet, apparently. I probably have some dirt in my head. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, let's discuss this. I'll try to give you information about random sampling more specifically here. All right. And systematic here. In 
close to here. And stratify here. Again, convenience sampling, which I did not make space for. It's really just working with whatever is available, right? I wouldn't call it really a sophisticated technique for doing something. Yeah. Um, you know that you're dealing with something random, right? When you know that you've been employing a random sampling technique, I should say, when, right, um, any item, person, or what have you, has an equal chance. of being selected. That's why I say uh, uh, the people uh, involved in counting bison uh, probably employed something of a random sampling technique uh, because any one bison was virtually indistinguishable from another. I mean, that's not really true. Every animal was a unique animal, but um, <clears throat> As far as the math is concerned, they all had an equal chance of being selected. Right. So when any item or person or some combination of items and people has an equal chance, right, that's a random sampling technique at, at play. Which is why I say this is something like the lottery. When is this useful? Um, this is useful when the items in a population are all similar. in regard to a specific characteristic. Researched. This is useful when the items in a population are all similar in regard to the characteristic being researched. And there's a how to. Um, just for the lack of space, let me put it here. It's a couple of steps. Um, number one a number is assigned to each item. element or what have you. Number two, to decide the sample size and how many you want or need for your research. I 
that is as many needed for the sample. Now, um, just as a side note here, you have a random number generated in your calculator. So as long as you have the uh, standard uh, TI-30X, <laughs> interestingly, um, if you do like to play the lottery, and I don't want to uh, either persuade you or dissuade you, um, you could actually have your calculator decide the numbers for you if you have trouble like me deciding. Right. Uh, let me turn this on. Okay. This PRB, which I believe stands for probability, and if you press that, it might be a little hard to see. You have something called permutations and combinations and factorial. Um, if you scroll backward, there's random and there's random integer. This is the one that you want. Random integer will give you a whole number. Right. So if you choose that, you'll see the random integer function and then the cursor will be flashing. You basically want to choose boundaries, where to start from and where to end. If the software were a little bit more sophisticated, say if you had the TI-83 uh, or 84 graphing calculator, there would be a third uh, sort of uh, vacancy uh, for deciding how many numbers you want all at once rather than having to press the button several times. So let's just say that you start with zero, which means zero could be a number that gets thrown up here, and then you put a comma. There is a comma here behind the parentheses. So in order to engage that, you would have to hit second, and then this, and you see the comma, and then choose um, another, the, the upper limit, the upper boundary. So if you're playing lottery, let's just say 40. I don't think it goes up to 100. Right? And then be a good sport and close the uh, parentheses. All right, so you see something like this. Random integer function, lower boundary, that's uh, an electable uh, number as well. And this is the upper boundary that could also be chosen. Right. Now, if you press enter, it'll spit out a number and it will keep doing it until you're bored. <laughs> so here you have it 31. All right, hit it again. Zero. See, it was a possibility. All right, seven. All right, five, it looks like, right? No, it's two, sorry. Uh, I'm reading it backwards 25. Uh, let's see, 10. 55, right? No, 22. Right? And you can keep doing that. It'll keep generating random numbers. Right? If you, again, are doing a random sampling, or uh, performing research that involved random sampling, again, you want to assign a number first to each of the, uh, the items, which could be a person, right? And then decide how many you need, all right? And then use a random generator random number generator to call the numbers. Uh, in an old-fashioned way, you might have gotten a, a lottery drum, you know, again, with like tickets of numbers on the inside, and then just hand by hand, you know, pulled out a number, right? This is better because it's not um, than a mechanical thing because th th there's no chance of it not being mixed literally, right? This is uh, purely uh, controlled. Right. Anyhow, uh, just for reference, I'll write this P or B button. All right, you want to scroll backward really to where you see random integer. All right, and then you'll see that on your screen. And then you want to choose uh, boundaries a lower and an upper limit. Alright, and then you press enter. And move it on. Uh, let us see if I can fit this in here. Alright, um, if you want to employ syst systematic sampling, Right, you would do something similar. You're going to again assign a number. To each item. Now 
elements or what have you. Uh, again, decide the sample size. And in this instance, you'd be more strategic. Right. Select a starting point. Random point to start counting. Like it doesn't have to be zero, you could start at five. And then choose, you know, every nth item, person, etc. Nth is a lot of times how they break that number. The tenth, right? The fifth, the sixth, so forth. Item. Again, this is something kind of like decimation, although that's brutality. You know, you kill the tenth person, every tenth person. Thank you, Romans, for your creativity. Cruelty. Um, <clears throat> but if you select every nth, whatever you specify that to be, all right, that's systematic. Right? There are potential issues. The sample space must be genuinely unbiased, <laughs> as in any case. And if you only check the tenth, like if you were, you know, say, analyzing robots, you know, on an assembly line, if you only check the tenth, then you might be, you know, obscuring that there's issues with the ninth, you know, and so forth. Uh, cluster, all right. Again, when you, uh, telltale sign that you're dealing with cluster, which involves grouping, and you want to sort of distinguish that from stratify, which also involves grouping somehow. Um, realize that this pertains to a geographical area. So a lot of times what will happen is that an area will be divided into sections. And then you randomly select um, either one or two situations. Let's call this 2A, um, an entire cluster, which is a section really. I need the space, so let me erase this. Or B, you select. Um, random sample of the members from each cluster. Take a geographical area, divide it into sections. These are clusters. And then randomly select either an entire cluster onto itself or randomly a sample, a random sample of the members from each cluster in use, which may be three out of, let's say, four, in theory, clusters. Uh, and 
example of something like this would be like a pallet of oxes, of pens. A pallet would be, you know, the entire population of pens, right? And maybe you took one box from the pallet, right, to analyze it for defective pens. The box is the cluster, it's the section. It's a volume, really. But think of it in two-dimensional sense. Uh, let us see. Again, this is a similar, it's a group somehow, instead of an area. This is more deliberate. Grouping. More intentional. Population is divided by characteristics. Uh, which are known as uh, stratifying factors. way of saying characteristics. You know, for example, um, religion, you know, or income perhaps. How to do it? Well, uh, number one, a population is divided by strata. Think of like rock formations, <laughs> layers, if you will, according to one common characteristic. And they need to erase because I need this space. Second step would be <clears throat> from each strata a random sample of the same amount. school classes. There are freshmen, sophomores, uh, juniors and seniors, right? Colleges, four-year colleges the same way. That's the one characteristic above all of, of the people that are say all 14 or 15 maybe. They're all freshmen, right? They vary every other way except that one way. Each of those classes is a stratifying factor, you know, their age, basically. 
And so if you're taking a survey and you want maybe 10 freshmen and 10 sophomores and 10 juniors and 10 uh, seniors, you might employ uh, stratifying deliberate technique like this. Okay. Now, um, let me just uh, discuss these examples that you have here. And then I'll get close to close up for today. All right, if you have this piece of paper, the solutions are here, all right? But if these are your five choices, the real four, random, systematic, cluster, and stratified, and convenience, all right, which is working with what you have, all right? You might try to uh, classify them according to these descriptions here. All right, so uh, the first one is identify the sampling technique used to obtain a sample in the following, all right? Every 20th soup can coming off an assembly line is checked for de defects. If they're telling you a specific number every 20th, every nth, that would be a systematic sampling. All right. Uh, B, a $50 gift certificate is given away at the annual bankers convention. Tickets are placed in a bin and the tickets are mixed up. All right. If they're mixed up intentionally, that means that any ticket has just as good a chance as any other to be picked out of a lottery bin, if you will, All right. without saying those words. Then the winning ticket is selected by a blindfolded person. This is a description of a random sampling technique, right? When any one item has an equal chance of being selected. Uh, C, children in a large city are classified based on a neighborhood school they, are, they attend. A random sample of five schools is selected, right? All the children from each selected school are included in the sample. Right? All right, this is a cluster sampling. You're talking about a geographical area, all right? Uh, this is a city, basically, and then you're chopping them up into schools. Well, that's the, that's the, the section or the cluster, however you want to call it. Right. Um, D, the first 50 people entering a zoo <laughs> are asked if they support an increase in taxes to support a zoo expansion. All right. This is an example of convenience. It's not these four. It's just working with what you have, and it isn't necessarily unbiased either, so it's really not the best thing. The people who go to a zoo can be found at a zoo, all right? And if you ask them, hey, should we have zoos? They're probably gonna go, yeah, we should have zoos, right? If you went to the bus station and asked, should we have zoos? They might give you more of a balanced, you know, perspective. <laughs> they may be in favor, some and some not, you know? Anyhow, that is an example of a convenience sampling. All, right. uh, all registered vehicles in the state of California are classified according to type. Uh, Subcompact, compact, midsize, full-size SUV and truck. A random sample of vehicles from each category is selected. All right. If you're classifying things, those are stratifying factors. All right. uh, a subcompact is a certain size, certain weight. Of car, you know, a truck is obviously something larger than that, right? This is an example of stratified sampling. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to give you is sort of a diagram that's, I think, practical. Good advice. All right, so let me get rid of this. Um, you should examine statements very carefully before accepting them as facts. So let's just consider some um, misuses of statistics, unfortunately. Right, what to look for. Here's a joke. There's some variation of this, you know, I, I'm sort of riffing here, but uh, you've probably heard this statement, and it's a joke. All right. 
50% of all statistics are made up. <laughs> that statement is also made up. So it is true <laughs> in the sense that statistics can be made up, right? But this number is the statistic, right? It's a joke. Right. Um, here are some questions to ask yourself. When you hear statistics. Especially online, right? That's a very unreliable source of information sometimes. Questions to ask yourself right, when quoted statistics. Right. First of all, right, was the sample unbiased? That is fundamental. Right. Again, if you go to a zoo and start asking the pedestrians at the zoo, should there be zoos, they're probably all going to go, yeah, all right? Which, again, zoos are not a bad thing, but I'm like, you're not getting a balanced perspective, all right? It's kind of a weird question to ask someone, should there be zoos, granted, but again, you want to make sure that you have unbiased data, all right? It is truly representative of the entire population, not just people who are interested in one thing or another, all right? Also, um, was the sample size a sufficient size? Sufficient. Right. When it comes to statistics, right, more is better. Right. The more people you have, the better data you have. Right. Right. The more measurements you take, the better you are, you, the more precise, uh, or I should say more accurate, um, your, uh, your research will be. More is better. You don't want a limited amount of something. The convenience technique in theory exists, right? Con convenience sampling, but if you just ask 50 people, again, it, it may not be a sufficient size, you know, uh, to call it true, you know, empirical data, <coughs> legitimate data. All right, and uh, lastly, is the statement being quoted to you potentially ambiguous? Meaning that it has more than one meaning and whoever is saying it is counting on you not really doing any research and just accepting it for whatever the context you think it is. Or whatever the context they want it to be. All right. Um, I had this idea that what I would do is print up uh, the comedian George Carlin's uh, translations of uh, advertising jargon. It's funny. All right. Uh, it's potentially offensive. <laughs> all right. But it's actually very thoughtful. All right. Like he famously said, he was talking about um, you know advertising about food. Right. If you've ever heard of something like. Uh, a New York style uh, deli, right? Basically, just because they threw in the word style in the advertisement, this whatever type of food it is, or establishment, 
all right? It is really indicating that it's not where, it's not New York. <laughs> because if it was in New York, then you wouldn't need to go style, you know? Advertising is filled with a lot of uh, stretches of the truth, you, will, you might say, and ambiguity as well. All right. So do be careful, all right? Um, statistics is a noble um, uh, paradigm, all right? A noble aspiration for all of us. You should definitely research, you should definitely get involved. It's cool, all right? It's very helpful, all right? But you want to be an ethical person, all right? You don't want to just, you know, uh, use it to sell by to sell some stuff or whatever have you a product right you want your data to be unbiased you want it your data to be of a su sufficient size and you don't want anything to be ambiguous because that's making things less clear all right math is about clarity right ideally it's to demystify the universe not to make it more complicated all right anyhow uh thank you for sticking with me all right uh, for homework again you really don't have to do um, uh, 12 tubes, we didn't get into it yet, right? I'm at an hour 41 here. Uh, what you want to do is the prerequisite for chapter 12 statistics and uh, this section, section 12.1, okay? Ideally before Wednesday, but certainly before the due date in December, okay? Be careful out there.